Okay, well, welcome to the Breast Oncology Innovations in Breast Cancer Research webinar this evening. Uh, we have a couple of exciting presentations um, to uh, present and allow you to see some of the exciting um, events that are happening in the treatment of breast cancer. Um, I need the, we have the next slide, please. I, I need to announce um, before this, we get into the business of this, that the content of this is not intended to be medical advice and the viewers should consult their physicians should they have questions. Viewers should not rely on information contained in this presentation or webinar for immediate or urgent medical needs. Additionally, if you think you may have a medical emergency, please call your physician or go to the nearest emergency department or call 911 immediately. Um, never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking care from it because of information obtained in this presentation and webinar. Um, a lot of what we're going to be presenting tonight are things that are new. Um, some of the things are being tested in preclinical trials. Some we're going to show you are beginning to be tested in patients with breast cancer. And we're hoping that some of these things will become more the standards um, to replace some of the therapies that we currently have. So um, tonight, we're going to have the next slide. Um, we're, we're going to um, take you on a little bit of a journey to how we can use the immune response to both treat and prevent breast cancer. And we're going to show you some exciting um, changes that the immune response can cause in and around breast cancer. And there's also no reason to believe it can't do the same thing against even other cancers. But we'll start the evening, if I have the next slide, um, Dr. Hatem Solomon is a medical oncologist in the breast department. Um, he's a senior medical oncologist in our department, and he's also a member of the immunology department at Moffitt. And he's going to talk to you first about using the immune system to target triple negative breast cancer. And then I will follow up with him on some newer avenues to target both HER2 triple negative and um, ER positive breast cancer. So Hatem, um, you can uh, begin. Do we have a time here yet? Oh, then skip ahead to mine and I'll I'll go and he, he joined him. I know he was in clinic and he just talked to him and he said he'd be right on. So um I'll give you some introduction and it's actually probably better that I talk before him anyway, because I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that happen before treatments are going into um, cancer. And then um, he'll, he'll talk specifically about triple negative breast cancer. So uh, go ahead to my next slide. So this is what happens in an immune response um, during uh, breast cancer. If you see there's a breast cancer in the middle here. And these are all types of immune cells that can infiltrate or go into a breast cancer, some of which will um, inhibit the immune system from doing its job. And others of it will help to um, cause or can cause the regression of the tumor. Um, 
For instance, this mature dendritic cell starts most immune responses, and this natural killer cell here can also kill some of these, and B cells and CD4 and CD8 T cells in here want to help to eliminate the tumor, whereas certain types of macrophages here and even these inhibitory regulatory T cells will, will stop some of these cells from doing their job. And what happens is it's a balance, like a seesaw between the pro-tumor helping immune response and the anti-tumor response. And most of what we do for treatments of breast cancer affect that balance between the pro and anti-tumor immune response. Chemotherapy shifts the balance. Radiation to a little degree shifts the balance. Surgery probably has an occasional balance shift in some people, but for the most part probably changes the balance less than things like chemotherapy and radiation. Next slide. Um, a lot of what happens in breast cancer can be mimicked to the way the normal breast can breast develops. Um, when you're a teenager, most of you can think back and see you start to develop breasts when you're um, 11, 12, and you get these little terminal end buds that start to develop and you develop a few rudimentary ducts. Then as you start to age, you um, increase the branching of these ducts. And um, these things are kind of helped along by these receptors that are also called oncodrivers uh, because they can also drive cancers, but their normal function is to actually drive the growth of normal ducts in the breast. And um, there's a couple right here such as ERB2, which is also known as HER2, which some of you may have heard of as a subtype of breast cancer. Why? Because those breast cancers have that protein overexpressed. ERB3 is also known as HER3, frequently is activated in triple negative and HER2 breast cancer. Um, EGFR is also HER1, can be found in triple negative breast cancer. So can um, CMET, all these are oncodrivers that drive the growth of the breast in pregnancy to a degree and in lactation. And believe it or not, after um, a woman lactates, all the extra ducts that grow need to um, die off and the immune response keeps track of that. And this same immune response is the same immune response that we're trying to reactivate to get it to um, fight the cancer because it's been altered by some process in the, in the breast. Next slide. This is an example of HER2. There's many treatments. HER2 used to be a lethal um, type of breast cancer in most patients. Today, at least the early stage patients, it's highly curable. And we have examples of antibodies or immunotherapies that target HER2. There's also um, drugs that can inhibit this receptor. But to tell you the truth, the most effective is this molecule called trastuzumab or Herceptin, which happens to be an antibody. And this second antibody called pertuzumab, these are actually the most or the most potent um, HER2 targeted agents that we have. And it's because of their ability to activate an immune response that they're so potent. Many of these other um, HER2 targeted agents just target the inside of the receptor. They don't generate a huge immune response like the antibodies do from the outside. So that's a clue that the fact that antibodies can help drive an immune response and can help target breast cancer. I show you that as an example of HER2, but that can be for other tumors next. So um, 
I'm going to show you uh, just a quick preclinical um, example of how we can use immune response to get rid of uh, cancer. These are uh, mice that have um, breast cancer. And you can see these cancers can grow quite readily, this blue line here. And they will grow and eventually will uh, metastasize and kill the mice. And if we just treat with antibodies like trastuzumab and pertuzumab, this particular tumor has to be is happens to be very resistant to it. It does very little to slow the growth down. But if we add one of the immune cells that I showed you on the other um, slide uh, called the dendritic cell that I said starts an immune response, you can see it starts to slow the tumor growth. But when we take both those cells and we add the antibodies, trastuzumab and pertuzumab or cancilla, we can actually cause the tumors to completely go away. Um, and and th this is very significant to make um, a, a breast cancer go away, stay away. And if we challenge the mice again with that tumor, they completely reject it. Next. Not only can we do that, um, you can keep going. We, um, we can take even other antibodies that are anywhere in the tumor or the tumor microenvironment. This is a molecule that happens to be um, on some HER2 breast cancers, but it's also on immune cells that infiltrate in. And if we take an antibody that can activate an immune response, mix it again with these dendritic cells, we can cause HER2 breast cancers to completely go away. The cells have to be activated in a certain way. They have to be given antigens that are on the tumor or, or feed it little bits of the tumor. But the most striking thing is um, down here. Let me call your attention to this. We have to inject these dendritic cells directly into the tumor to get this to happen. The neat thing is, is if we have another tumor somewhere else in the body as here, and we treat this tumor, this untreated tumor completely goes away as well. And the mouse is cured. This mimics metastasis where you have a primary tumor in one place and a metastasis in the other, and we can make it disappear. So the punchline here is that if you take an antibody that can activate the immune response in a certain way and give that in combination with a dendritic cell that primes an immune response, you can make breast cancers go away. Next. And we call that a smart circuit. So the dendritic cells come in here. Some of them will migrate out and activate other cells and, and things like lymph nodes. You've all heard of sentinel nodes or um, the lymph nodes under the armpit. These um, dendritic cells can activate all the cells there. They can go out and then the cells that remain here help to pull these cells back in so we complete this circuit. And this is exactly what happens when you have an infection. Next. So we've actually started to do this. And in HER2 breast cancer, we've started a trial where we actually just give that immunotherapy with these dendritic cells and the two anti-HER2 antibodies for six weeks prior to um, starting less chemotherapy than someone would get weekly Taxol, and we continue the Herceptin and Progetta. But the nice thing is um, we did some biopsies before and after the immunotherapy alone. So we can actually see, we even did MRIs to see what effect just the immunotherapy has on the tumor. And we're given different doses of the cells. Next. And you can see these are MRI scans. This is an example of someone who got such a treatment. This is about an eight centimeter tumor. These are positive nodes that have been biopsied. Here's simply after the immunotherapy, you can see the nodes have now normalized. The tumor, while not gone, is dramatically reduced from just that immune response for six weeks. And then if we give a little bit of chemotherapy, there's nothing left after that. In fact, this person went on to have surgery and was found to have a complete response um, to that treatment. 
Um, this is another example with a higher dose, large tumor, about almost five centimeters, reduced down to a couple centimeters, even within this few short weeks with no chemo. Here's another one, and this one is completely gone. The mass is um, gone, and you see this inflammatory reaction. Next. And to show you... Uh, and to show you what's happened in that breast and that last patient I just showed you, this is their core biopsy before all this blue, this light blue is all tumor. And the other colors are different immune cells. And you can see some hanging out here, but they're not doing a whole lot. After we treat this and you see this go away, I had to blow this image up to actually see the little bits of tumor that's left. And you can see how this immune response has come in here and just destroyed. This is the whole core like you're seeing there, but I only found tumor in a few little spots as it's disappearing. And then that's their MRI later. Next. We can do the same thing with triple negative breast cancer. Dr. Solomon's going to talk to you about that. I'm not going to dwell on this too much. Suffice it to say that we now can use immune stimulating antibodies that take the breaks off the immune system and they can cause regression of tumors, triple negative breast cancer in mice, and they can actually do the same thing in patients. These are actually um, tumors that are responding in metastatic triple negative breast cancer to just that antibody alone, just that immune stimulating antibody alone. And the more mutations there are in a tumor, the more likely um, they respond to the immunotherapy. Next. Um, we, we now have, and Dr. Solomon's gonna go through this, um, therapies that add to chemo, an immune therapy and triple negative that adds an antibody. This has actually been approved by the FDA um, and the, the administration of that antibody with chemotherapy Next slide, results in an increase in the odds that someone would have a complete response, which correlates with better long-term survival. Next. We're doing the same thing I just showed you with HER2 in triple negative breast cancer. This is a um, trial that one of our investigators has opened, Dr. Costa with um, delivering these dendritic cells intratumorally before they start the same regimen that um, we give with the anti at the anti checkpoint antibody. Next slide. Um, in this case, because it's triple negative, we're given not only HER2, but HER3. And you can see if you alternate HER2 and HER3 injections in the tumor, you can make the tumors disappear. That's in mice, next. And um, this is the scheme of the trial. We actually start to give these to drive an immune response into the tumor before we start the chemotherapy treatment. Once um, that's going, we continue it for a little bit in the, with the early chemotherapy. The theory is if you can get a good immune response in the breast, it makes the chemotherapy and the other immune therapy antibody work better. Next, and this is an example how this works. This is was a young woman who's in her 30s who had a five centimeter triple negative breast cancer. Um, it was actually by the time we started treating even bigger than this, she was having quite a bit of pain. We um, started that trial with her, um, injecting those tumors within two weeks. She actually had relief of her pain. Her tumor started to shrink. And with just half of the chemotherapy regimen, her tumor was completely gone. We took her to surgery early um, because she was having some problems with her gallbladder, had gallstones, and she needed that removed. So we did a lumpectomy for her at the same time. She had had positive nodes. All her nodes were, um, were negative at the time of, and her tumor was completely gone in the breast. Next. So we can do this in breast cancer that metastasized someplace. This is an example of breast cancer that's gone to the brain. Some of these um, markers are on these. Next. 
Um, again, these are mice that have a horrific um, type of breast cancer that metastasized to the spinal cord, and they um, actually die rather quickly. Um, but if we inject in their um, spinal canal those dendritic cells, and if we do it with antibodies, we can actually have quite a few of those mice be cured. And in a human, this is a lethal condition that people last one to two months if they're lucky. And so we now have a trial started to actually do this with our neuro colleagues. Next. These um, vaccines and things also can kill these type of cells that have actually left the breast and are sitting out quiescent or silent in the bone or other organs. We call them disseminated cancer cells. These cells, these vaccines are very um, good at squelching those cells, not allowing them to grow into metastasis. Next slide. And this is an example of that. We, we transferred from both mice and patients um, these disseminated cancer cells that we can actually aspirate from the bone marrow. And if we treat them first or treat some mice with a vaccine, we can stop those cells from ever becoming a tumor throughout the life of the mouse. Um, we can do the same thing with human cells, but we have to put them in a mouse that has no immune response. If we treat those cells with something the immune system makes, it stops them from becoming an active metastasis. Next. So, to summarize, we can put in the, in the tumor, we can put some immune cells that drive an anti-cancer immune response. We're hoping with some more trials um, and some more research that we can, we're, we're very close to a point where we may be able to eliminate the need for chemotherapy or drastically reduce it. Um, in both HER2 and triple negative breast cancer. I don't have time to show you, but we have the same thing happening in ER positive breast cancer now. Um, I also showed you that we can do this with brain or central nervous system metastasis. These immune things can also be used in prevention. We can interact with the breast early. We can prevent a lot of cancers from happening next. So I'm gonna now introduce who I started to introduce earlier in the um, presentation, and that's Dr. Solomon, who's gonna really give you a little more information about the immune system in triple negative breast cancer. So Hatem, take it away. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining the webinar. And um, just to kind of go over some of the information that would be helpful for what we call triple negative breast cancer, it represents about 15% of cases um, that we see in the US that amounts to around 43,000 cases per year. And it consists uh, actually of multiple different subtypes. So triple negative breast cancer isn't one diagnosis, it's actually a mix of various types of different biology. And we're starting to unravel what that means as far as how the tumors behave. For example, the basal subtypes that we call them uh, that have certain markers, one of them being EGFR or HER1, uh, as Brian was talking about the HER family. Uh, those are the more aggressive, typical ones that we're quite familiar with that can have good responses to chemotherapy, but also in some cases uh, may have an aggressive pattern of spread. And then there's these LARs, they stand for luminal androgen receptor positive breast cancers. Many of those triple negatives may happen in older individuals and can have like a more uh, indolent or slower behavior. And then these mesenchymal subtypes are triple negative breast cancers that can be very difficult to treat. They generally can be chemo resistant and uh, they're definitely an unmet need. So we're kind of unraveling a lot of the biology around triple negative breast cancer to hopefully be able to better target uh, this type of breast cancer. And the survival is generally poorer relative to other subtypes. Uh, the estimates by the NCI is around at 70% uh, of patients are alive at five years. Uh, there's a greater incidence of these types of aggressive cancers in younger women. Uh, minorities do get them with a little bit more uh, frequency. And then those that are BRCA1 mutation carriers uh, can also develop these triple negative breast cancers. And so in general, there's a great unmet need still for more effective therapies. You have a, a long way to go before we can say that this problem's licked. Next slide. 
So Brian showed this uh, schema um, for you earlier, and this is uh, what would be considered now the standard of care um, for the treatment of high risk stage two or three triple negative breast cancer. Um, and this is the incorporation of the immunotherapy drug pembrolizumab alongside chemotherapy in order to try to get a better response in the tumor before surgery. Um, and so typically that's going to be important now to keep in mind is that more and more now we're realizing that especially when it comes to immunotherapy, treating the tumor while it's in the body is actually probably the better way to go. Because if you try to treat with immunotherapy after the tumor has been removed in some cases, the body doesn't have uh, enough of the antigens to react to. And, and so we find that in many cases, giving some treatment with immunotherapy while the tumor is there in the body actually may respond in a better way and get the immune response revved up even more. So uh, we, we would treat with chemotherapy, but also give the uh, pembrolizumab alongside it um, for approximately 20 weeks, and then patients go to surgery, and then it, it's followed up with uh, more of the pembrolizumab by itself. Um, and as Brian showed earlier, uh, that response rate or complete response rate when you do that combination is around 64% of the women will get a complete response to the treatment. Next slide. And so this kind of shows as well why the treatment got approved, though. It wasn't just on the basis of the improved response rate. The FDA was also looking to prove that giving the pembrolizumab, the immunotherapy alongside the chemo, actually resulted in higher cure rates. And that's what they were able to show eventually over time was that a higher proportion of women who got the immunotherapy were uh, cured. And so if you look at the comparison at the three-year mark, uh, close to 85% of the women were cured of their disease without any kind of recurrence at the three-year mark versus those that did not get the immunotherapy, it was about 76%. And so that led to us uh, adopting it as a new standard of care uh, because these improved responses preoperatively were translating into higher cure rates for women with triple negative breast cancer. Next slide. Now, one of the things that we've been really starting to appreciate more and more though now too is that um, the immune state of the triple negative breast cancer tumor in a patient really matters, right? This has a, a pretty profound effect on how well a woman will do, right? And so one way to think of it is that if you were to subdivide these tumors into like tumors that have either a low amount of immune cells infiltrating it, an intermediate amount of, of cells infiltrating it, or a high number, right? And we have these different cutoffs uh, that we would say constitute uh, low, intermediate, high. So a pathologist would look at the tumor and say it's a high infiltrated tumor if there's more than 60% of the cells in that stroma or the tumor it are immune cells, right? And as you can see, uh, as you go from left to right in all these bars here, the higher the infiltration with the immune cells, the better the response rate, right? So this calls out a subgroup of patients that do very well with current treatments, right? And their tumors are already extensively recognized by the immune system. Now, this figure on the left with this red squiggly line here is uh, a sorting of over 3,700 tumors, triple negatives, that had looked at different levels of these immune cell infiltrations, right? And what uh, they were able to show actually is that a large proportion of the tumors, right, up to about 60% of them um, will have low infiltration, right? And about another 25 or so percent will have like this intermediate level of, of infiltration. That leaves you about a, a third or so that are at the higher end of the range that are heavily infiltrated. So the big question that we have is how can we take more of these low immune activated tumors and flip them over to high immune infiltrated tumors in order to improve responses and outcomes. That's really one of the main goals of my research is trying to figure out how can we get the immune system revved up to recognize these tumors more effectively. Next slide. And this led to one of the projects that we wanted to think about is that if you imagine uh, some of these images that Brian showed in his last talk where he showed you like those light blue cells, uh, so that's the image on the left, right? So you see the cells sitting there in their nests, and you can imagine that they've built up this like fortress, right, uh, within themselves to protect the cells from the attack uh, by the host immune response, right? So they've erected various barriers to keep those immune cells out, right? And the goal that we want to do is we want to get to the picture on the right, where you see all those immune cells in yellow 
basically storming the castle, right? They've been able to break through those defenses and they're getting in there and they're starting to take out the cells, right? And it's almost like a medieval battle, right? And so uh, you can conceive of it as, as uh, you know, the army trying to break through the castle wall and they're using something like a battering ram, right? To get in there. That's the kind of idea that we had as well to say, how can we, uh, you know, activate the immune response and get through those shields, if you will, uh, and allow those immune cells to get in. And so that kind of spurred some of our research and work in order to conceive of one of the trials that uh, was quite successful here at Moffitt. And uh, with the next slide, we'll be able to go into that. And so we wanted to say, well, what tools do we have in our armamentarium to be able to break through that wall? And one of the tools that was just coming on the scene uh, was something called an oncolytic virus, right? And so these are viruses that naturally exist in the environment, right? But we could not use them uh, previously because they were known to cause diseases and infections, right? So it wasn't amenable as a tool to use to treat cancer patients if it was going to make them sick. However, modern science has allowed uh, scientists and researchers to be able to engineer these viruses in such a way that you're able to prevent them from causing the disease that they would naturally cause when they infect the patient. However, they retain the ability to attack cancer cells. Right, So they can infect cancer cells very effectively, but because you engineered some of those changes, you're able to get them to ignore normal cells. Right, And so by doing that, they love cancer cells. They'll get in there and replicate with great efficiency to the point where they burst open. Right, And that's where the name oncolytic comes from. It's basically lysing the cells open from the sheer volume of viruses uh, that are replicating within them. And so this is just an example of some of the changes that have been made to one specific virus that we used in our trial called TVEC for short, and it's a genetically engineered herpes simplex 1 virus. This is the virus that causes cold sores, and the vast majority of adults have been exposed to this virus during their lifetime. Next slide. And so when I, when I teach students and, and, and graduate researchers about why use oncolytic viruses, right? It's that in essence, the virus can take some of the things that make cancer cells so difficult to kill, right? And actually turn them to their advantage so that it acts like an Achilles heel uh, for the cancer cell, right? And so oncogenic signaling pathways, the kind that like Brian was talking about that predispose cancer cells to grow out of control, right? they actually are attractive to viruses because that allows them to make more copies of themselves when the cells are activated and growing without any kind of uh, uh, regulation, right? And many of these different mutations are uh, advantageous to oncolytic viruses. The other thing too is that these cells will have defective immune signaling, right? So as they're trying to get away from your immune system and become stealthier, right? They also shut down some of their internal defenses against viruses. So when the virus does get into a cancer cell, it's able to replicate better. Why? Because the cancer cell doesn't have the tools to be able to ward off the virus similar to our healthy cells. And finally, cancer cells don't like to die. They like to be immortal and survive, right? And divide without end. Well, that allows cancers, uh, cancer cells to be a very fertile ground for viruses to replicate because normal cells will try to sometimes bump themselves off and kill themselves in order to limit the amount of virus that's produced, right? But cancer cells don't do that. They're not altruistic that way. So they'll continue to produce more viruses before they rupture. So all of these things give the, the oncolytic virus an advantage and allow them to better target tumor cells compared to normal tissue. And so the goal is to try to re-engage the person's immune system and recognize those tumor cells as targets that need to be taken on and not ignored. Next slide. And this is just kind of a cartoon figure, though, showing that oncolytic viruses have multiple benefits by recruiting different arms of the immune system. So Brian was talking about, for example, the dendritic cells, the informants of the body that he educates in the form of a vaccine to get them to target various antigens. Well, oncolytic virus can wake up these dendritic cells as well by releasing danger signals as the cells burst open. And that's another signal that can activate dendritic cells to take note and pay attention to what's going on and present those tumor targets to your immune cells so that they can begin to attack. And that stimulates various arms of the immune system, as you can see in the circle, right, in order to launch a more productive anti-tumor attack. Next slide. 
So this is just a schema of what we did here was that um, when we conceived of the study, the standard of care was not to give that pembrolizumab that I pointed out earlier. This was before that was approved. So the standard of care back then was just to give chemotherapy, which was this paclitaxel for 12 weeks, followed by four doses of doxorubicin and cyclophosphamide. Uh, women that have been through treatment know doxorubicin is that red drug, right, that they get for four doses. We did not give the virus during those treatments. We gave them during the lower dose weekly paclitaxel treatments. And women got five injections directly into their tumors under ultrasound guidance. So we would give the virus directly into the tumor so that we could stimulate that attack during chemotherapy. And then the women would go on to surgery. Next slide. And then this is just an example of what we were doing uh, when we were injecting the tumor. And if you can make out here the, the straight line that's going across the ultrasound image, that's actually the needle going across the tumor that's right in the center there of the screen. And so we would guide the needle directly into the tumor and then precisely infiltrate the tumor with the oncolytic virus and try to get the virus to seep throughout the tumor bed so that it could start to infect the cells and take them out and stimulate the immune system. Next slide. And so we were able to treat um, a variety of patients with different stages. Most of them were stage two. Uh, many of them did have lymph node positivity. Um, some of these tumors were quite large. We had, we had tumors that were eight centimeters in size in some cases um, with some remarkable results. Most of these were high grade. And we showed that the treatment was very feasible to give, that women could get all of their chemotherapy for the most part. Um, and also get almost all of the planned doses of the oncolytic virus delivered to their tumor and then successfully go on to get their surgery, radiation, and any other adjuvant therapy that was needed, uh, although many did not based on the treatment that we gave. So uh, the treatment was feasible and uh, was able to be administered. Next slide. And as far as side effects go, the treatment overall was quite well tolerated. It did not result in any kind of significant increase in unexpected side effects uh, that we would have seen basically by combining the two agents. Many of the side effects were side effects that we would expect to see when women were on chemotherapy, like anemia, like fatigue, like nausea. However, some of the unique side effects that we were able to see with it is that you did see some women develop some fevers or constitutional symptoms as their bodies began to react to the virus infecting the tumor, which is by design. We were getting their immune systems to react and we expected to see some of that too, right? Uh, one advantage of our treatment was that we did not see some of the autoimmune side effects that we see with pembrolizumab, such as the adrenal gland or the thyroid glands being negatively affected. And that could be because the immune system gets overly activated and that can take out some of those endocrine glands accidentally as bystanders. But we did not see that in our study. Next slide. And this is uh, uh, some of the results that we got um, from the treatment. And so uh, over 45% of the women basically on average developed a complete response to the treatment. Historically, only about a 30% response rate was expected from the chemotherapy alone. However, too, what we noticed was that an additional 20% of the women uh, had what was called a near complete response. So when we looked at these tumors under the microscope, they were almost completely obliterated with the exception of maybe a few cells within the tumor bed. And what we found was that women that either achieved that complete response or near complete response had a 100% survival rate uh, out to a median follow-up of well over three years. None of them recurred. The only recurrences that happened were in women that had significant residual burdens of disease, basically, which were the minority of the patients that we had, uh, roughly about one third. So uh, and of those patients, only four relapsed. So as you can see, the outcomes of the treatment were excellent with uh, many women uh, being cured of their breast cancer with relatively minimal side effects added to their chemotherapy treatment. And uh, we still continue to follow those women to this day. Next slide. And these are just some more images of what we were able to see when we interrogated the tumors and we were able to get biopsies on treatment. So this upper left-hand panel is an example of the cold tumor microenvironment before any treatment is given where there is no immune infiltration. You could see that most of the cells are blue uh, the cells that are mostly the tumor cells with very few immune cells. But then as you go along here in these other panels, like the uppermost right panel, you could start seeing the infiltration 
of the tumor with these yellow and red bands of cells. And these are the soldiers storming through the castle, if you will, as a result of the treatment that we gave, that you can see the immune cells are really getting in there and starting to attack uh, the tumor cells with vigor and eradicate them with a lot more effect than just with chemotherapy alone. Next slide. And when we did some additional analyses within the tumor, and we were able to get a lot of information on the molecular uh, changes that were happening, looking at changes in gene expression and, and other aspects of the tumor biology, we confirmed that most of these cells that were storming the tumor were of the killer subtype that we wanted to recruit. So these are kind of your foot soldiers. They're called the CD8 killer T cells that we can recruit into the tumor and try to get them to go and basically eradicate the tumor cells around them once they recognize the target. And so in each of the cases, we're able to show that these tumors become significantly more immune infiltrated compared to what they were before treatment, which was our stated goal when we went into the trial. Um, we also found that a number of immune signaling pathways were uh, clearly associated with a better response as shown in this lower right-hand figure as well. So many of these pathways that were in green here are associated with patients that you know had improved activation while they were on treatment. And all these pathways are indicative of the person's immune system starting to attack the tumor properly the way we want them to. Next slide. Uh, this little colorful figure, again, is, is another way that we can analyze the various cells in order to get a sense of what cells are also kind of getting recruited. And as I told you earlier, many of those killer T cells uh, were brought into the tumor. However, we also noticed that some of the different tumor cells uh, were able that were being lysed were able to recruit uh, immune cells that we call uh, innate uh, cells, such as natural killer cells or natural killer T cells. These cells are considered like some of your initial first responders going onto the scene. They don't necessarily get trained on a specific target they're just called in early on in the process of immune activation because there's danger signals that are floating around. And these cells don't necessarily go after a specific target. They go after cells that are diseased or look generally abnormal to the, to the body. And they start taking out some of these cells before the adaptive T cells, the ones that start to recognize specific targets, um, are able to be brought up in sufficient numbers to then sustain the attack. So we think, interestingly, that these immune cells may be very important in some of those early stages of response to oncolytic viruses. And by recruiting them, we can get basically a jump start on the tumor while the rest of the immune system is waking up so that it could begin to, the attack. And I think that's something that we want to explore a little bit more over as well. Next slide. And then uh, also we were able to identify biomarkers and we presented this data at ASCO in Chicago where we were able to show that um, we could identify women with specific genes that could predict for a better likelihood of response to the virus. So in that case, by using these signatures, we may be able to um, select these women for this approach or figure out if we have to add other drugs basically into the mix to allow the oncolytic virus to work better. And this was exciting research that we were very proud to present at today at uh, this year's conference. And we hope to be able to leverage this information in future studies to be able to help us pick out those women that are likely to respond well and those that are not and tailor the treatments to better uh, improve outcomes over time. Next slide. And so I just wanted to wrap up my presentation with another take on this as well. And this is a spin on what Brian was talking about is that we wanna tackle as well those treatment resistant triple negative breast cancers, right? That um, are not completely being eliminated by the preoperative therapies because they have a high risk of relapse. Next slide. So here you can see that is that if you have women that have a complete response to the treatment, they have over a grady 90% chance of being cured and have a very good prognosis. However, the women that do not get a complete response have a much higher risk of relapse. And so the question is, can we intervene at this stage before they present with metastatic disease with a more effective immune therapy that can basically take these women that are at risk and put them up into this very good category with a high likelihood of cure? Next slide. And so what we're trying to do is be able to identify women who have that minimal residual disease at that very earliest stage before they show up with metastatic disease on scans by doing blood tests such as things called Signatera, which can try to detect small traces 
of DNA that's leaking from residual tumor cells in the body before they're actually visible on scans. And by looking to see in the blood, if those cells are present, we may be able to get a signature or a bead on those cells very early on before they have a foothold in the body and hopefully stimulate an immune response that can take them out before they can cause relapse and eventual uh, death from the disease. So that's really what the goal of this project is. Next slide. And so we're trying to launch what's called the precision dendritic cell pilot study. So Brian was showing you the notion of being able to use specific proteins like HER2 and HER3 added to the dendritic cells in order to try to stimulate an immune response against what we call those shared antigens. Those would be proteins that would be expected to be on a large number of tumors across multiple patients. However, what we're trying to do is basically take the tumor that's left over that the patient has still in their breast after the preoperative chemotherapy and do a genetic analysis to see what neoantigens, we call them, or tumor targets are present on their specific tumor and that could be very personal for their tumor, not necessarily shared across a variety of different tumors. So in a way, we're trying to personalize the dendritic cell vaccine for their disease in order to try to improve the chances that the immune response recognizes the targets on their cancer. So we'll be able to be uh, generate the vaccine uh, specific to their target and give it alongside immunotherapy after surgery. Next slide. And really, that's going to be, I think, the future for us right now is figure out how can we leverage the combination of immune agents prior to surgery to kind of get that effective attack going so that we can eradicate the largest number of tumors prior to Brian going into the OR and removing that area and seeing that there are no cancer cells left. However, if we do have residual disease still left in the breast, then we want to press on with the attack in a different way to develop a personalized cancer vaccine platform for each patient to help prevent recurrence of their high-risk disease after surgery. And we think by tailoring the vaccine that way, we'll have a much higher success rate of being able to cure women over time. And with that, I'll, I'll wrap up and uh, be happy to take any questions from the group. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Atem. Um, that's, um, you guys have been treated to some exciting breakthroughs in um, the future of breast cancer and how we can use the immune response to um, really work to get rid of a lot of the toxic things that we give um, patients with breast cancer. So um, just of note, I, you, you need to realize that some of these clinical trials that um, have been presented here tonight are actually funded by patients and grateful donors who want to see breast cancer eradicated more quickly. And so uh, I want to introduce Janet Caramello from our foundation, um, who is our representative in the breast oncology world, um, to say a few words about the Moffitt Foundation and um, philanthropy and, and breast cancer. Janet? Thank you, Dr. Zernicki. In just a minute, we'll return to have the question and answer portion of our webinar. I want to thank you for your time this evening. You all have busy lives, and there are so many things that you could be doing on this Thursday night, but you chose to be with us, and we are truly grateful for it. I want to thank Dr. Zernicki and Dr. Solomon for working late tonight and providing such good insight on these exciting breakthroughs here at Moffitt. Also, I want to thank my colleagues, Brielle Humphreys and Tom Procopio for managing this webinar behind the scenes tonight. The expert doctors we heard from tonight not only benefit local patients, but their work truly has global impact. There are several breast oncology research projects that are still in need of funding. If you have an interest in exploring ways you can provide philanthropic support for this important work, please contact me at your convenience. Thank you again for joining us. And now I'll turn it back over to Dr. Zernicki for the question and answer session. Dr. Zernicki? Okay, um, uh, there's, a, there's quite a few questions in the um, chat box that I'll, tend, I'll try to group together and between Atem and I, we'll, we'll try to um, answer for you. 
So um, I'm, I'm gonna start off at some of the groups here and say, um, there were a couple of questions that we're asking about, is this only for triple negative or what about ILC and IDC? Um, I assume people are talking about ER positive breast cancer. And the answer um, to that question is, um, <laughs> we need more funding because we do have ideas and we actually are starting some preclinical um, work with hormone receptor positive breast cancer or ER positive breast cancer. Those tumors, at least in mice, seem to respond to the same kind of treatments that um, Tam and I are both um, talking to you about tonight. And so it's only a short time before that's going to happen. And we are actively um, designing a trial right now for patients that have metastatic hormone positive breast cancer that have mutations in their estrogen receptor, which happens from taking the anti-estrogen pills for a long time. And so probably within the next year, we will have a trial open for people with ER positive breast cancer. We already have them open for triple negative as a 10 showed you and I showed you, and we also have some open for HER2 breast cancer. But there's there's still need even among those to improve outcomes. And Atem just proposed something to you at the end about people who have residual disease after breast cancer. Try We're, we're going to try to vaccinate them to um, against the mutations in their residual tumor. Atem, do you want to handle um, a couple of other questions? Yeah, sure. Um, as far as the side effects questions at the top here, uh, some patients uh, can get uh, what we call constitutional symptoms from injecting the dendritic cells, or they can get some uh, chills or, or low-grade fevers. Uh, occasionally, the, the lymph nodes can get a little tender. And that's, again, all a byproduct of the normal process of activating the immune system and will be expected. Pembrolizumab can cause somewhat similar side effects, although it also causes some other autoimmune conditions different from chemo. And that's basically the immune system non-specifically kind of uh, attacking different organs of the body. And like I mentioned earlier in my talk, it could affect your thyroid gland, your adrenal glands, but sometimes it can also affect uh, the skin, causing a rash, uh, the colon or the lungs, um, as well as the liver. And so any of these organ systems could be affected by pembrolizumab. And that's why we monitor patients very closely uh, when they're on treatment. Um, and so that's some of the side effects from uh, pembrolizumab. Um, see, there was a, there was a question about, um, extensive, let's see, scar tissue. Um, Brian, do you want to take that one about scar yeah. tissue after surgery? So, um, it, uh, from both surgery and more so even from radiation, people get, um, scar tissue around sites of mastectomies or lumpectomies and the breast or the lymph nodes. We do have pretty good imaging um, tests that can be used to detect um, recurrences. Uh, mammogram, ultrasound, and especially MRI can be used to identify um, people that have more or less heavier scar tissue and maybe can't feel things. Those imaging tests really work really well. Um, I see there was another question about can we attenuate immune responses by improving gut health in the microbiome? And the answer to that is yes, but we need a lot more um, research on exactly what microbiomes are needed to help the good immune response work. In mice, we can transfer through the gut microbiome in animals that we, we, cure, we cure with the immunotherapy that um, I showed you we gave them, we can transfer the stool from those mice into mice that have a tumor that haven't been treated with an immune response. And the ones that are cured will help to cure the mice. So there is things in the microbiome, but it's, it's going to require much more extensive study to make it into a, a useful therapy. Go ahead, Tim. And um, there was a question about uh, chronic neutropenia uh, creating increased risk of recurrence. 
Um, we have not seen data uh, to say that you know people with uh, with uh, that are necessarily at higher risk across the board. Uh, that may feed in though to if you are immune compromised chronically with your other white cells being depleted, that may uh, in some cases you know uh, raise the risk of another cancer down the road. Uh, but having low neutrophils doesn't always necessarily translate into a higher risk of recurrence, it just depends on what's going on with your immune system at the time. Um, immunotherapy uh, being only for those with a current cancer, is there a vaccine for survivors? Um, so I think, you know, there, there is a lot of work that's actually being done right now to try to see if they can do a preventative vaccine, even for, for those patients that are not diagnosed with cancer, right? And those that are survivors, uh, you know, we say they're functionally cured from their prior uh, breast cancer case. But if they still have their breasts, is there something that we can immunize them against to prevent another one from popping up in the future? That's something that Brian alluded to down the road is that, you know, we may be able to do that. Uh, the only challenge with those kind of studies is that they require very large numbers of patients. I know, Brian, if you want to comment further on that. Yeah, the um, the BRCA mutation carriers and the, and the hereditary breast cancer patients, I saw there's a PALB2 in BRCA. Mm -hmm. um, we're actively right now. Um, we have a grant pending um, to look at vaccinating those carriers prior to going to surgery to see if we can generate enough of immune response in them that can um, change the immune environment within the breast. And if we can do that, then then we could talk about um, trying to do preventive, um, treatments. The use of this, Hatem mentioned this a uh, couple of cells um, uh, of the immune system that he mentioned, natural killer cells and natural killer T cells. Those cells are very important in the immune response. When um, a woman is finished breastfeeding, those cells migrate in and destroy all the extra ducts that aren't needed we believe we could use that kind of an immune response to just destroy um, um, ducts that have potential to develop cancer in the hereditary mutation carrier. So more to come on that uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. um, real quick, there's one question I had, um, asking about restarting Keytruda. This would be like medical advice, but I will say that if you were hospitalized or sick, you know, generally we wouldn't re-challenge you with the Keytruda. And in some cases, you may have already derived the benefit um, from the Keytruda, um, and, you know, while you were getting it preoperatively. So rechallenging you with it after the tumor's out may, may do may do more harm than good in this particular situation. Um, there's a question about do men respond to this as well? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there isn't anything inherently in in uh, say a male breast cancer situation that would preclude them from benefiting from these approaches. Um, you know, there are some differences between males and females as far as immune response, but um, I think these approaches could be valid and they do use immunotherapy for males with various types of cancer. Um, so we think this model could be beneficial in that as well. Brian, do you agree? Yes, um, there, there's no, males get mostly hormone receptor positive cancer, so they rarely get triple negative or HER2. I mean, HER2 occasionally happens. So the majority of the subjects have not been males in these trials, but the immune response would be the same and they should work just the same. There's a question on here about um, who else is doing this type of research in Florida around the globe and how do we get government entities to help fund this work? Um, those are um, good questions. Uh, we, we continuously have to... Um, apply for grants and there's only so much federal money that's available to people. And so um, donations and philanthropy help to move this along quicker to not dependent on the government. And as far as who else is doing this, there, there are various groups around um, the world that are working on various aspects of the immune response. So um, they are there are people working on this in various places. Um, 
in Florida, there's a group at the Mayo Clinic in um, Jacksonville that does some breast immunotherapy work. Um, mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. Well, we got a couple of minutes to go before we have to wrap up, but I, there's a couple of themes here I just wanted to address real quick is that there's a lot of questions about liquid biopsies and using Signatera uh, tests to monitor patients and is it a standard of care? So right now it's not considered a standard of care because the evidence around whether they're clinically actionable is still kind of being developed. We do have some information that they can predict for relapses at a very early point. What's not clear right now yet is if that information is useful to avert a metastatic recurrence, but it is something that is available for many women to be able to get under the ordering of physician that's following them. Um, and this is a third party lab that does this. So um, the data over time will mature. And if it bears out, this could allow it to be considered a standard of care, particularly if it's something that we can intervene on to meaningfully improve outcomes, which is, I think, what a lot of us are waiting to see. And then there's multiple questions about uh, if there's trials for ER positive disease. And Brian kind of pointed out, we are beginning a trial where we're looking to see if we can target, say, the mutated estrogen receptor that may emerge during treatment with drugs like letrozole and anastrozole, right? So Brian's lab has shown that you can target these mutated constitutively activated estrogen receptor proteins by using a vaccine like the ones that he's developing. So they're actually in the process of launching studies that could help ER positive diseases this way um, as well. Um, Brian, any any kind of last words on that before we wrap up? No, but I, I think we will we will get um, immune responses in patients that have estrogen positive cancer because that is the most common um, type of breast cancer. Um, I hope you're all um, excited about the prospects of using the immune response to um, treat breast cancer. The hour's late. I want to thank everybody for joining in the um, in the webinar this evening. I want to thank Atem for his presentation and those from the foundation, Janet and her colleagues, for putting this together. Um, and I hope you guys have en enjoyed this. Um, this evening. So thank you. And um, we will adjourn. Thank you, everybody.